Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to the final talk in the Stained Glass Museum's Autumn Talk series for 2023. Uh, apologies that we started a couple of minutes late this evening, but um, I'm delighted to welcome you. My name is Dr. Jasmine Allen, and I'm uh, the director and curator of the Stained Glass Museum. And I'm going to ask um, Sue Tate, our speaker, to just turn her video on so that she appears um, in front of you now so I can introduce her. See, so I hope you're there. We can see you going through your slides. So you're moving. <laughs> there we go. Good evening, Sue. Can you just unmute yourself? Brilliant. You, you should be with us now. Okay. Thank you. Um, so as I was just saying, we're delighted um, that Dr. Sue Tate has agreed to speak to us this evening. And a special welcome to those of you who were meant to join us a couple of weeks ago when Sue was unwell, but we're delighted that she is better now. Um, her voice has recovered and um, she's going to speak to us about Pauline Boaty, who is a fascinating artist, um, one of the founders of the um, British pop art movement. She was um, a charismatic, charismatic uh, artist and individual uh, who produced work in stained glass, in collage and paintings as well. Um, she actually studied stained glass at the Royal College of Art. And this evening, um, we are really pleased that Dr. Sue Tate, who is a freelance art historian, um, who actually is the leading expert on Pauline Boaty, um, having curated uh, several exhibitions on Boaty, including a very significant one, I think about 10 years ago at Wolverhampton Art Gallery, um, to talk to us this evening about Boaty's work, but especially thinking about the relationship between her collages and her stained glass works, of which I only know a few. Um, the image on your screen is one that has recently been put on display at the uh, newly refurbished National Portrait Gallery. And of course, the Stained Glass Museum is very fortunate to have a panel on loan, um, which is one of Boaty's works and an absolutely key work in our 20th century collection. So I'm going to hand over to Sue who will um, give us our talk. And then at the end, we will take questions via the Q&A and the chat. Um, and if you do have any technical issues during that time, please do pop them in the chat and we will try and help. Um, so over to you, Sue, and I'll come back at the end. Thank you very much, Jasmine. Yes, as Jasmine has told us, she was a founder of British pop. Um, charismatic, talented, highly intelligent, well-read, stunningly beautiful player on the London swinging scene of the 60s as well. And she was also a proto-feminist who challenged gender stereotypes of the time, making work from a female perspective, as we shall see in the stained glasses as well. Yet when she died tragically young, aged only 28 from cancer in 1966, she disappeared from cultural view for nearly 30 years. But more recently, she has returned to full visibility. Last year, a painting sold for just over a million pounds. Our times have changed. She studied stained glass at Wimbledon, her first college for her national diploma, and then for her postgraduate qualification at the Royal College of Art. Yet after graduating, she didn't pursue stained glass at all. And we have to think why. The answer, as you will see, throws light on the particular circumstances of the institutions of art, particularly for young women. And these external circumstances took her to stained glass, where she produced a lovely, if small, body of work that is truly innovative and offers a unique and fascinating interface between pop art and stained glass. So, in 1954, age 16, she joined the Wimbledon School of Art, against her dad's wishes, but with the support of her mum. She'd grown into a strikingly good-looking young woman, attracting everybody's attention, admired and courted. And, as her friend at the time, Beryl Corton, remembers, that as young as 16, she was very ambitious. Even at that age, she would say, Beryl told me, look at those other students. 
They are just here filling time until they get married. That's not what I want. I want to be a painter. I'm a serious artist. And we can see the serious intent in this self-portrait. She strips away any sense of glamour. She gives herself a very objective, cool appraisal of her own face. And she fixes us with this steady gaze, as if challenging to think us to think that she's anything other than a serious artist. She also acquired the sobriquet, the Wimbledon Bardot, and she rather enjoyed playing up to that as well, this uh, very sexual identity. But for her, it was not an either or. She wanted to be a full person. The two year intermediate course at Wimbledon and at other colleges provided a broad foundation in skills in both vocational crafts and the arts. And from the beginning, her talent is evident. For the craft element, she focused on lithography. And here we see a lithograph of Notre Dame and a self-portrait with cat. A sketchbook drawing, well, it's just, uh, coloured with um, watercolour, is a really sensitive portrayal of her uh, sister-in-law, Anna. Um, and I think it shows, again, this sort of a very, very exquisite and, and finely tuned ability to, to grasp the representation. And in a number of oil paintings from this period, she's only 16 or 17, there's a confident handling of technique and medium and good representational skills here in still life or um, also uh, seen in other works. On completing the intermediate certificate in 1956, the usual practice at the time was to look around in your own college and find a, a section, a department or whatever, for a di diploma course that would meet your needs. Initially, Boti joined the Department of Painting, which was her real concern, her real interest. However, it was very far from the modernist front line, dominated by traditional figuration using a limited brown palette and she was too lively for this. She wanted something different. And after six weeks, she moved to the stained glass department because it was under the leadership of a new and dynamic young tutor, Charles Carey. Not much older than his students, it was his first teaching post, and he soon drew around him a lively band of enthusiastic uh, students. And here we see the the uh, students from the stained glass school with Charles Carey on the extreme left. By today's standards, that year was a tiny cohort of only five students. Ray Bradley and Tony Attenborough were the two men, but very unusually, oh, and both of those men went on to careers in stained glass, but very unusually and fortuitously, Bodhi was one of three committed and ambitious young women, Anna Lovell, and Gillian Wise, uh, both of whom went on to become professional artists. Gillian Wise became a leading figure in the British con constructivist group. They became great friends, went to Paris, and in the Wimbledon uh, canteen, they would come to the table, hands cracked, stained with pigments, and uh, surrounded by acolytes, they would intellectualize furiously about artwork. To some of their contemporaries, it felt like being the ca cafes of Paris, apparently, where the Impressionists gathered for their heated debates. Carey was also unusually supportive of female students, um, and this was, in many ways, made for a very good start for Bo Boti at this point. Um, he had studied... Um, he had studied at the Royal College of Art um, and trained in France, and he encouraged students to work in a range of media, including painting and collage. And we see in Boti's work here, she's obviously um, learning from Bonnard paintings that she has seen in Paris, or here, a still life, which is kind of tipped up to the picture frame rather than a Cezanne-esque way. Um, Carey had studied, as I said, at the Royal College of Art when stained glass was very much the modern thing. Anything happened more modern than what was happening in painting at the time. 
And we must remember that the iconic abstract stained glass works at Coventry emanated from the Royal College of Art um, School of Stained Glass. Since the 40s, Carey had had a really lively interest in popular culture. He knew what, uh, Blake and he knew all about the emerging pop aesthetic, the independent group who were meeting at the Royal Co at the Institute of Contemporary Art. And uh, he visited, obviously, and I think took his students to the 1956 exhibition, This Is Tomorrow, which featured Hamilton's famous collage that we see here, something that is often seen as the first truly pop work. Boti was constantly collecting for and making collages. Um, and here we see a, a collage that she made as uh, a Christmas card for the Carey uh, and for Charles and his wife, for the Careys. Breaking with traditional approaches, Carey set projects with swimming pools, nightclubs, and encouraged students at Wimbledon to use collage as, he told me, and I quote, a way of importing immediate and contemporary images. So they collected torn posters, bus tickets, labels, anything. Anything that, he said, suggested the life outside the rarefied atmosphere of anatomy, art history, life models, the smell of turpentine. The students pursued a fascination with montage and collage. Max Ernst was an influence which resonated in Boti's early college, as was Schwitters, the German Dada collagist that Carey introduced them to. A project for a war memorial, a stained glass, incorporated Union Jacks and collage of old photograph images that was very much part of the proto-pop iconography. After a discussion of the reported assertion that Picasso had said he could make a work of art from the contents of a waste paper basket, Boti made this stained glass. Um, the actual work is lost and the photo could be clearer, but I think you can see, you can make out the lettering of a torn poster and so on. In another early stained glass, again from a photograph, she translated one of her collages directly into glass, something that she would continue to do at the Royal College of Art. As I think you can see, the medium with its hard edges, its sudden juxtapositions across the leaded outline, offered itself unexpectedly, perhaps, to this collage approach. One of Boti's stained glass pieces was selected from the 1957 Young Contemporary show, Icarus. Uh, these were annual, very important shows, which collected the work of the top students from colleges, co colleges across the country. Uh, people like um, David Hockney, Bridget Riley, and so on made their first appearance in exhibitions through the Young Contemporaries. So it was uh, important that Boti was also uh, included in these shows. The work is lost, but these are perhaps preparatory drawings. I think the drawings have a tremendous style and it's a dynamic way of portraying this falling figure in, in quite an explicit full frontal pose, which I think would be quite daring at the time. Another work from this time is this stunningly beautiful piece, Sheba Before Solomon, which was exhibited in 1960 to 61 in an important Arts Council touring exhibition called Modern Stained Glass, where it was seen alongside leaders in the field, Patrick Renchens, Keith New, Peter Lanyon, John Piper, as well as her own tutor, Charles Carey. And Boti was one of four listed as students of the Wimbledon School of Art. Now lost, this is a, re a digital reconstruction made by Charles Carey. Sheba is an iconic identity. It's been a point of reference from in feminist activity from the title of the Sheba Press, one of the first feminist publishing houses of the second wave. And Boti's choice shows a proto-feminist prescience in the biblical story, Sheba is a rich and powerful monarch of Yemen, having heard as 
Solomon's fame and wisdom, she undertook the difficult journey to Jerusalem to test him with hard questions. When he answered them all, she gave him praise and gifts of gold, spices, and precious stones of fabulous value. Solomon reciprocated, giving her whatever he asked. And it's this original form of the story, a meeting of equals who recognize and appreciate each other, which is how I think Boti is picturing Sheba in this richly colorful, glorious stained glass. Surrounded by her retinue and a phallus of elephants, peanut, peacocks and golden fruit, she stands with the biblical text behind her. Her stance, upright with the arms tucked in and the legs together, produces quite a phallic form within a velvet oval of the dark blue text and the framing decorative element. Overall, in subsequent retelling over the centuries, the story of Sheba has been reframed to, re to uh, convey a very different truth. As Jacob Lasner has written in The Demonization of Queen of Sheba, from a clever, politically astute sovereign to a demonic force threatening the boundaries of gender, the queen was now portrayed as defying nature's equilibrium and God's design. In these retellings, the authors humbled the queen and therefore restored the world to its proper condition. And Sheba has entered Western culture as a seductress, a siren, with a tremendously powerful sexuality embodying the kind of lush, exotic, erotic East portrayed with relish in Orientalist works in the 19th century in the literature, opera and painting. In 59, 1959, Gina Lodger Brigida starred in King Vida's film, Solomon and Sheba, and she is just such a sexy seductress. At the time, another saying was, who does she think she is, the Queen of Sheba? A common phrase in the 50s and 60s, when young girls were socialized not to draw attention to themselves. And this, in this work, I think Boti is gloriously tapping into the original meaning, portraying Sheba, portraying Sheba as she would be, wish to be, as a sexual being with her own powers on equal terms as a person with men. Boti certainly drew attention to herself. She was an active and politically astute young woman. She threatened the boundaries of gender, but until more recently had been carefully patrolled. And it could be argued that that 30 year hiatus uh, and the complete marginalization in the mainstream of narrative of pop for that time was a kind of hum humbling in order to restore the world to its proper condition. So I would argue we have here a feminist stained glass. And also one in which shows technical excellence. Other students spoke of the very good technical grounding they got at Wimbledon. And here we find also exquisite handling of color and competition, composition. Um, right, so, by jumping ship from the traditional department of painting, she was able to tap into the innovative liveliness and excellent choice of working with Charles Carey, where she could continue painting and make college. When she left Wimbledon, she was a well-educated, confident young artist, ready to take on the next phase of her artistic life, which meant applying to the Royal College of Art, the most prestigious art school in the country. But here we meet with a different reason for her mark work in stained glass and a less positive one. The Royal College of Art was prestigious. Uh, to get in at all was an accolade. Fine art schools had the highest cuges and she was advised by family and friends not to try for the School of Painting. It was too much competition, too difficult for a mere girl as her oldest brother Arthur told me, to risk she should apply elsewhere. And the statistics would seem to prove his point that there was a gendered problem here for young women artists applying to the Royal College of Art. In the year Boti applied, 32 students graduated from the School of Paintings. Eight were women and four of those eight 
age, 50% got first. Only three of the 28 men who graduated got first, 10.7%. By the college's own standard of bestowing a first-class qualification, women had to be better than men to get in. So, although painting and collage were her real interests, she applied to the um, Department of Stained Glass. Carey had formed a real link to the Royal College of Art. She'd taken the students there, they felt at home. And of course, she was already um, familiar with and, and uh, already demonstrating good technique in, in stained glass itself. So, she got a place and uh, for the first year, she um, traveled from home and then moved into a flat in Notting Hill with her friend, Jane Percival. Now, this was before the Royal College of Art was housed in the new building and the out near by the Albert Hall. And the different schools and departments were scattered around various buildings in South Kent. The stained glass department was at 23 Cromwell Road opposite the Natural History Museum. They had three rooms all together, including a basement with a kiln to fire things, lead things up and so on. It was redolent with acid fumes, the heat of the furnace, the glass fragments crunching onto fruit. It was described by students as a stinking hole. Their tutor, Keith New, was, according to a fellow student, Ray Bradley, friendly, but not collaborative like Charles. Pauline was excited and stimulated to be in the city proper. She threw herself into student life, soon attracting attention, attending dances, film club, performing college re reviews. The course itself was um, no longer cutting edge. It had moved to the painting school. Um, and the course involved visits to churches and museums and it was mandatory to produce a direct copy of a chosen piece, usually from the V&A. There was little empathy or interest in a pop sensibility. Working at home, Pauline painted and made wonderful collages. She was influenced by Max Ernst in her use of prints from sources like the London Illustrated News, for example, in this piece. Her Royal College of Art thesis was centered on dreams and their strange dislocations. And this has the sort of nightmare quality she was interested in cap capturing. This disproportionately large hand bearing secateurs is threatening to decapitate children as, they, as it brings it up, them up into the sky. Whereas below the passers-by walking through a botanical garden are taking no notice as though nothing is happening. Uh, influenced by Schwitters, she also spoke of um, just picking up things to use, like cigarette packets, as we see here, buffalo packet of cigarettes. Elsewhere, in other collages, milk bottle tops or a book of matches. And whilst this was uh, her main attention at home, in her usual enthusiastic engagement with life, and I think with innovative elan, she brought her creative talent to bear also on stained glass, bringing her collage aesthetic completely directly into the stained glass work. Now, this collage, Siren, we know from the wonderful pop art film, Pop Goes the Easel, that Ken Russell made for the highly regarded BBC arts programme, Monitor. Pauline was one of four artists profiled along with Peter Blake, Derek Boucher, and Peter Phillips. The pre-programme um, in pre interview, uh, which is held in the archive of the BPC, uh, Pauline told Ken Russell that she took lots of what I thought would be Freudian symbols and what have you. It's all really based on sex the whole time, like bananas and fountains and that huge mouth. The lady is obviously a sort of, um, well, she's a Victorian pinup from the gold rush and the hand, well, they're all phallic symbols. As she says pinup, she hesitates. She can't quite bring herself to say prostitute, but in fact, the figure is, whoops, Diamond Lil, a famous prostitute who became a, a wealthy madam. 
Interestingly, Mae West wrote a script for a play of the same name, playing Lil herself in her inimitable ironic style, ridiculing social attitudes, especially towards sex, not unlike Beatty herself. Beatty translated this collage directly into stained glass. Sorry, there we go. Directly into stained glass. This is the course, the piece which is in Ailey's Ely Stained Glass Museum. Disproportionately large bananas entered from the right, a male hand rigid in its armoured gauntlet from the left, a fountain erupts in the middle distance, and dominating the main part of the figure of the foreground is the siren, unfashionably voluptuous, not unlike Boti herself. Again, this phallic closed form of the figure. Interestingly, the, uh, the, the doorway at the back is a mannerist cave doorway from the garden of an Italian duke, an image that very much interested various surrealists about whom Pauline was knowledgeable, an image discussed at length by Dali and Cocteau, and I love the way Pauline is weaving together high and low culture, a photograph of a gold rush prostitute with high culture, mannerism, and surrealism. And in a very pleasing segue between collage, stained glass, and painting, Lil was to appear a year or two later in a painting, Epitaph to Something's Got to Give. Um, and here you can see that she has actually painted the photograph into the painting. When I first saw this work from a, across a room, I thought she collaged this form, but it's another example which she was developing her later pop art works of what I've called painted collage. A nice segue here. Um, she also told Russell of the Freudian images in this collage, the shape of the bottle, bottle, very phallic, where the fruit and flowers are coming out of the woman's crutch. Um, and she told him that this was a collage that had particularly disgusted her own mother, provoking her to exclaim, to think I've got someone like that for a daughter. I mention this in the context of these designs for stained glass windows, possibly for a local church. As far as we know, they were never made, never made up in glass. And according to Boaty's daughter, Boaty Goodwin, Pauline made them to placate her mother so shocked by her daughter's less conventional work. And Boaty's daughter commented that one of these designs was displayed on every wall of the house. Another example of this direct translation from collage is in this piece, Architectural Details, Edwardian Woman and Danish Blue. The choice of architectural artwork suggests the sort of liminal spaces of railway stations, or perhaps it's the glass dome of the Grand Palais in Paris that Pauline would have been very familiar with. The snooty Edwardian figure, perhaps a new woman, seems to be turning away in disdain from a classical figure below her. The architectural details are scratched into the black areas before firing to get that sharpness of line, which is so effective. A very early, oh, here's the stained glass, sorry. That's the collage. Here's the stained glass with the um, lines of the uh, ironwork scratched into the black areas. A very early photograph of the collage shows the detail rather well. And going in close, we can see a cheese wrapper. I've rotated it here so that you can see the, uh, the writing. You see it's up on the left of the image in the collage. And uh, here I've rotated it. And you can see the writing, it's Danish blue cheese. And of course, this is very like the, it, well, it is the same use of frotsam and jetsam that she referred to when we saw the Buffalo cigarette packet. Just, she would have been having lunch, here's the cheese wrapper, put it into the collage, that kind of immediacy that collage allows. 
And I rather like the detail that perhaps you can make out here where it says kept cool. Um, and of course, Boaty herself was indeed very cool, a nice little witty aside. I'm sure a deliberate uh, choice. So back to the stained glass, we can still just make out in the upper left, the, the writing um, now upside down with the blue still there. Um, in relation to his collages, Max Ernst spoke of the culture of systematic displacement. And we certainly see this in operation here, these disparate images and the leading within and across which we find these rather unlikely juxtapositions just feels totally appropriate, I think. And then there is this wonderful self-portrait as Jasmine told this now on display in the National Portrait Gallery, where it looks absolutely wonderful in the 20th century gallery. It's the only stained glass in the entire collection and it glows from the wall. Influenced by medieval stained glass that she had to study, we see the conventional borders with floral motifs and quatrefoils. The pose itself is hieratic. Holding a bunch of flowers in her left hand, she raises her right as if bestowing a blessing on us. And if she did mean this, I think it would be with a resounding chortle, tongue in cheek. She was already always ready to laugh at herself and find amusement as well as the seriousness. A report that the National Portrait Gallery commissioned when they were buying this piece describes it as, and I quote, a beautiful and assured self-portrait. The work incorporates many of the creative techniques associated with the influential stained glass department of the Royal College of Art at that period, including layering, aciding of deep flashed layers and expressive use of glass painting. The leading is experimental with eccentric use of arbitrary leads such as that cutting across the face of the figure. Oh yes, that piece of lead across the mouth. Interestingly, in the preparatory drawing, the lead is actually below her mouth. Uh, but in the, um, at, in the stained glass, it's firmly across her mouth. Is this a statement about the silencing of women? I think it could be. Um, certainly the silencing of women as thinking be beings who have a mind. It was something that she certainly experienced and she voiced very clearly in an interview with Nell Dunn a year or so later. Um, interviews published in Nell Dunn's book, Talking, Women Talking. The last piece, I've got stained glass, is... Um, this one, untitled, but I've named it Paris Dreaming Woman and Rose. And it's part of her final show at the Royal College of Art. The students would all collaborate in setting it up and they would uh, cover the windows in uh, to keep the light out and cover the furniture as well in black fabric to give the whole area a, a worldly, otherworldly um, feeling. This was one of three pieces that she had in her final show, but the other two are lost. The iconography, I think, is one rather wonderful. It's Paris. We can see Sacré-Cœur. We can see Notre Dame. And do you remember that from the early uh, lithograph that we saw earlier? And of course, Paris was a mecca for young artists. The existential bohemian scene around Jean-Paul Sartre and Simon de Beauvoir, who, whose writing Pauline Boaty had read and would discuss with friends. That whole scene was considered very hip. And Boaty, identifying with Juliette Greco, engaged with both the intellectual ideas and the boat, black stockinged look. Boaty went repeatedly with friends or on her own, soaking up the art, enjoying the boulevard, 
and a postcard of a rural work that she sent to fellow student Ray Bradley, dated 57, exclaimed, I am alone in Paris. Wherever I go, I am followed or asked to take coffee, etc., etc. Otherwise, Paris is marvellous. The painting, no words possible. So, it, and it's again what we see here is the reference to dreams that she really explored in detail in her thesis. The woman floats in the sky, sleeping, dreaming of Paris, presumably. And it includes in the imagery what would become her iconic symbol of female sensuality and sexuality, the rose that would bloom in paintings that were to come. After graduating, from the Royal College of Art, she made no more stained glass. Initially drawn to it in order to be in touch with exciting new developments in art at, the Wimbl at Wimbledon and studying with Charles Carey. Then as a way to benefit from being at the Royal College of Art, where despite the institutional sexism which played its part in keeping her out of the more prestigious painting school, she did meet share ideas with and later exhibited with key figures in the newly emerging pop movement. And although her chosen metier was not stained glass, she produced some truly beautiful and innovative works that bridge between what might be seen as a rather traditional medium of stained glass and the pop art aesthetic of the 60s. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, I know that you can't see uh, all the people attending, but I'm sure they have big smiles across their faces um, from what they have just seen and heard about Beatty. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing it with us. Um, please do put any questions or, or comments in the chat and the Q&A. Um, and, and while you're thinking up questions, if you don't already have them to hand, um, I will kick off with, with, with a few as well, if that's okay. Um, it's really fascinating to see that that process of that you showed us of some of the designs and then the actual stained glass works. Um, really, really fascinating. Do we have any idea um, how these works were assessed at the Royal College of Art from a technical perspective? Yes, I um, from what I have heard from specialists in stained glass looking at the work and also reported from students and others, she was um, seen as technically very, very proficient. Um, and I think it's part of her character that she did everything with gusto. If she was going to make stained glass, she was going to make it well. And, you know, if she was going to do a watercolour, she would do it sensitively and effectively. Um, and so, yes, I think as far as the technical aspect, there was no problem with the presentation of her work. I don't think there was much reception for her subject matter. I don't think once she'd left Wimbledon, there was any appreciation of how innovative and unusual and the, 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 the work was to bring imagery from collage into stained glass and to make this bridge between the two aesthetics. I think um, it, it just went unseen at the Royal College of Art. The people teaching there did not have that sensibility and were just not interested actually um, in, in work of that kind. So um, I don't think her work was marked very highly, but that was not because of technical problems. I think it was the disinterest in what she was trying to achieve aesthetically. And, and what she was doing aesthetically, as as you've pointed out, and, and I think I can echo is is really unique. Um, you know, there's there's nothing like it. But what's interesting is that the Royal College of Art, there's a few individuals of which she's the only woman, really. But um, mm. Jeffrey Clark and Keith New, who were there a bit earlier, 
mm. are also pushing the boundaries for the medium in and being quite experimental in their approach. Mm-hmm. And um, it seems that that was very much encouraged and it really was a golden years for, for stained glass um, in that particular department. So it's quite funny that you, it was referred to as a stinking hole because <laughs> the best 20th century stained glass in Britain came out of that. <laughs> yeah, I think that was just because uh, where the students were working was was quite cramped and um, in a basement, which is not ideal. Um, as I understand it, uh, the golden years were a little earlier than um, when Boti joined that that um, school, or oh, it's a department actually. Mm. Um, that yes, before she came, uh, in the previous years, when various um, stained glass workers were producing the amazing abstract stained glass for the Coventry Cathedral, there was a tremendous sense of excitement and that it was bold and colourful and abstract and pushing the boundaries and using a traditional technique to push boundaries. But it was in a certain direction. It was in that form of abstract art. And by the time Boaty joined um, the Royal College of Art in 58, um, it was already felt that the cutting edge had moved to painting. And already at that point, pop art ideas were entering into the consciousness. Um, There was a lot of discussion in ARC, which was the very prestigious student magazine of these issues of bringing together high and low art. They had members of the independent group who were writing in the um, in, in the journal ARC. Um, and it was very closely associated with the School of Painting. And of course, it wasn't long before there was Derek Bochier, um, Hockney um, and, and others, uh, Alan, Alan Jones um, and so on, Peter Phillips, all working in the School of Painting and by 61, 61, 60, um, they took over pretty much the um, young contemporary shows and made them into pop art shows. And it was very much seen that British pop art emerged from, from that school. So there was that shift of attention, stained glass no longer the cutting edge in the same way because the aesthetic had shift, shifted, the taste had shifted, the innovation was now seen to be in the school of painting, mm-hmm. which which is an interesting shift. So it wasn't that uh, people like Keith New, who who was um, both his tutor, I don't think it was that he didn't want to be adventurous and um, you know look for new and exciting ways of using stained glass. He just didn't get the pop aesthetic. He he just didn't understand it. It wasn't. Um, on his horizon, as it were. So it didn't interest him. Um, Italia says, other than as a pop artist, how would Pauline Beatty have wanted to describe herself? Interestingly, actually, that um, unlike most of the pop artists, she was happy to say, I am a pop artist. Um, when a filmmaker, Jean Antoine, came to London in the early 60s to make a film about pop art, he one of his questions for each of the artists was, are you a pop artist? And she was the only one with a huge grin who said, yes, I'm a pop artist, <laughs> because I think she was happy to be identified with and work closely with mass cultural imagery. Whereas the, um, the there was a sort of uh, insistence that pop art should keep a sort of distance on the raw subject matter of mass culture in order to be able to stay in the high art game. And Pauline Boaty was more interested in the subjective experience of um, mass culture. And as you can see in these images that I think we can all see on the screen, number of paintings, um, she was working in a very different way. So she's, uh, you can see the image of Jean-Paul Bormonde top right with that huge, quivering, ridiculous red rose on his head. This is a painting, it's called With Love to Jean-Paul Belmondé. It's about the experience of desiring your film star character. She's embedded in it. She's happy to be a pop artist. So yes, that is how she describes herself. 
Thank you. And it's interesting that question of, of mass culture because obviously pop artists embraced it in, in a new way. But I mean, from Brock P Picasso to Francis Bacon, they all often engaged with, you know, newspaper cuttings and um, objects that they found in, in images they found in magazines. But it was in a more distanced way. Um, but, you know, all, all classed as painters in, in our mm. eyes in, in a quite different way. Um, Ting asks, you mentioned several pieces of lost work. Um, mm. Was this because she was a woman or because she died young? Or I think that's an, a, a good question because um, th there are quite a lot of her paintings that survived. Some of the very few stained glass seems to survive. Could you say mm. a bit more about um, her body of work and its kind of rediscovery? And, and um... Yeah. Um, I think... Um... Certainly at Wimbledon, they tended not to keep the pieces that the students made. You could um, take a certain number, you know, one or two pieces with you. A lot of it was dismantled and used again. The glass was used again. Um, and I think this is true also, some of the Royal College of Artwork, uh, that they would keep some, and if you didn't collect it, it would get taken apart and, and used once more, recycled as it were. So it's difficult to know quite what happened to the stained glass work. Um, she is reported to have made small pieces as gifts to friends, but none of those have survived at all. Um, the paintings are rather different because um, the painting she exhibited in a number of important shows, she had a solo in 1963 um, at the Grabowski Gallery in London. And uh, on the whole, most of the paintings seem to have survived, quite a number of them, as have the collages, which were kept by people um, often she had given them as, as gifts. Um, of course, what happened when she died was that her paintings were put in the loft of her parents' house and they stayed there for decades. When her mother, after her mother had died, her father became too ill to look after himself and he moved to Pauline's brother's farm and the paintings came with him. And initially, the brothers were going to take them to the chip. They just thought, oh, we haven't got room for these. Let's take them to the chip. But it was um, Bridget, who is Pauline Beatty's sister-in-law, who insisted that the work was kept. She told me she didn't have any truck with pop art itself, but this was Beatty's work. It was part of the female line and should come to Pauline's daughter, Beatty Goodwin. And it was Bridget that defended them. And she put them in a good dry outhouse where they lingered until 1993 when David Meller discovered them. He found it a really emotional experience to discover these works that had lingered in this outhouse for so many years. So we do have a fair number of important paintings. And um, I think you can see from the images that we have on screen, um, the way in which she is working with mass cultural imagery. So we have Marilyn Monroe, who appears to be glimpsed between two screens of abstract um, color, or as I said, the Jean-Paul Belmondo with the, the rose on his head. She was um, a dancer on Ready, Steady, Go, the pop programme, and 54321 is celebrating that experience and the sexual anticipation that it brought. I think you can see it. It says, this is the picture lower left. Oh, for a fa. That was very um, radical to say such a thing when Kenneth Tynan used the F word on television a year later questions were asked in the House of Commons. So she was always radical, always daring, always pushing the boundaries. And she was also very political. So bottom right, we see um, a countdown to violence and it's down to the violence, male violence of America. So we have the assassinations, 
we had reference to the war in Vietnam, to the race, the violence, the race riots in Alabama. And we had that, that ham descending again um, with secateurs snipping off this rose, the symbol of femaleness, female sensuality. And it's another nice, interesting way of that she segues between media. So that hand we first saw in the collage I showed you earlier, and now it's in a painting. So she's using these, this imagery that collage allows you to think in that way, like putting things together, whether using stained glass or using painting. But coming back to lost paintings, the most famous of the lost paintings that we do have photographs of is um, Scandal 63, which is the Profumo scandal with Christine Keeler at the center of the painting. We know it was commissioned and we have a letter that references it and no one has been able to find it. Many people have really tried hard to trace it. We hope it's still in existence somewhere and uh, maybe it'll turn up at some time. But the, the question about whether stained glass um, continue, you know, continues to be available, it's obviously a problem. Um, and I'm in a way surprised that both the Sheba and the Icarus stained glasses are, are no longer available. Um, if anybody listening now has any idea where they might have got to, that would be fabulous to know. But I've interviewed Charles Carey and he doesn't know what happened to them, other than saying that he did know that work would be taken apart and recycled. Thanks, see. We've got um, a final question, which is about the, the self-portrait and the lead across the mouth, which you observed mm. was different in the design and the final um, stained glass. And, and Tara notes that sometimes lead across the face is um, often avoided when repairing broken pieces. Mm. But she, she, she says she very much likes it, um, but it may have been frowned upon in stained glass, which is a is another interesting take on it when you think about the conservation of stained glass, that that mm. kind of repair lead would be the first one that a conservator would want to remove and an edge bond, you know. So there's almost a, a play there with the, the actual medium of stained glass in terms of um, what you're seeing is not what yeah. you expect to see. That, that would sort of support my argument, which is only a supposition that it was a deliberate act by Pauline to say something about the silencing of women, um, something that she did feel very strongly about. If you read the interview she did with Pel Mel Dunn, as I said, published in Women Talking, she makes quite a point of how she believed women to be as intelligent as men, how women were un men were uncomfortable if you started speaking interesting ideas, they, they wanted you just to listen. Um, it was something that was of a real concern for her and she felt angry about. And I'm not making um, an unsubstantiated claim that she's a feminist. She gave a number of extraordinary um, witty, sometimes vitriolic, clever talks on a magazine programme radio programme, mag magazine style radio programme, um, in which she really, I mean, it, it's real strong feminist stuff, which could easily sit in Spare Rib magazine, 1970 something or other. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if this is a deliberate act and the fact of doing something that um, breaks the rules, cuts against the rules of stained glass that you don't put leading across her face. I think it's a deliberate act. I think I think she is making a point. And another thing uh, that I think is rather pleasing about this um, particular work, I mean, it's very evident in this work, is the way in which she conducts the curves of the leading. I'm not an expert in, in the technique of stained glass, but I've been told that to get these kinds of curves is actually quite difficult. And um, as the report said, it is a very competent, beautiful piece and she's managing that leading so beautifully. I don't think it's an accident at all that the leading goes across the mouth. Um, so it's a gorgeous, rich thing, which is also making a point. 
Well, from the, the close inspection of the piece that we have at the Stained Glass Museum that I am most familiar with, mm. it would seem that the leading is absolutely deliberate and more aesthetic than structural because actually sometimes it weakens the structure, the way that she uh, has the lead net. Um, and there are mm. a couple of vulnerabilities at, at certain points um, because of the the shapes that she's using and the mm. um and, and so I do think that it's a deliberate aesthetic, but it's one that works very well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think she was a very um, I was, well, I was going to say self conscious. She was very aware of what she was doing with different media. She also did work in in graphics, which are couple of really brilliant pieces, a poster for the Knack, for example, which is a really good bit of graphics. She would apply herself to whatever medium she was working with and do it well. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting what you say that she was, the, the, the choices in this piece in Siren. And also the way that she uses the paint, which is incredibly mm -hmm. expressive and, and free and, and quite um, dramatic with the, the kind of shading. Mm -hmm. um, not many artists are painting to that level at this time um you know it's it's interesting because her pop-up paintings are so brightly colored mm -hmm. stained glass you have all of those bright colors available but what she's actually doing in a lot of these pieces is is more interested in the monochrome painting on mm -hmm. top of um a, a, a pale shade with the odd bit of color mm -hmm. self-portrait is the most um colorful piece isn't it of the stained glass. Well, there's, there's also this which Sheba was obviously very bright. Yeah, so rich, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think, I, I do hear what you're saying, and I think, I think it is very interesting she's doing that. Also, because it does um, match the collage where a lot of the images, some of the images she used were from black and white. Right. So it's um, almost a mass media. Mm -hmm. um, but what I think is interesting is that she can choose to move between different uses of colour. So both this one, the Sheba, mm -hmm. and the self-portrait, neither of them are taken from mass cultural imagery. Yeah? Yeah. They're both um, making a different kind of point. They're celebrating something different. And so she uses the colour in this wonderfully rich way. Um, whereas if we go on to the... Um, you see the way in which the, 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 this image, uh, only the hand is in colour, the, the other is all black and white. And the collage itself that the siren is taken from is all in black and white. And so I think she wants to make this relationship between the found imagery from mass produced magazines and uh, art books and so on, which were often at the time still in black and white and then taking it into the collage with, as you say, just those bits of colour that enrich it without taking away that sense of the original collage. Even in this small body of stained glass work that you've shown us, you can see a, a real range here. So thank you so much, because I've, I've learned a lot and um, it's really nice to put this piece in, in a broader context and to better understand um, that re where stained glass sits in her wider body of work and um, and also to remember that many artists uh, who engaged with stained glass at this time, it was not always their first choice. Um, that, that hierarchy of painting being the, the most prestigious thing and stained mm. glass in the basement, but sometimes a route <laughs> to becoming a painter. And mm. of course, the, the medium of stained glass has benefited too from painters turning their attention to stained glass, uh, people like John Piper, um, mm. and Jones etc so th that relationship is very important um, for the history of stained glass mm. so and, and in this, in this case going in a different direction from Piper and others yeah yeah, yeah mm. absolutely um, fantastic well there has been um, since Sue's research actually 10 years ago there has been a kind of steadying growth and in interest in, in Boti I would say and that seems to have picked up especially in in the last couple of years um, so I should mention to everybody that Gazelli Art House uh, in London are having an exhibition um, that opens actually very soon, doesn't it? Next first next of time. December. First, first of December, December. it's to the public. There's there's um, an opening the day before. I'm not yeah. sure if that's generally open or not, but and yeah. there's a new a new book or a couple of new books out. Um, so when we 
send the link around to the recording to everybody. We will make sure that we send you also the dates of those exhibitions and links to you by Sue's book um, and uh, an, a new book that I think someone else has recently written mm -hmm. or writing. So, and the film I think is coming as well. Yep, there's one in production. But there's lots going on and I'm sure Sue has had lots of um, involvement in many of these projects. So thank you mm. again for sharing um, all of your expertise with us tonight and for tailoring such an excellent talk for our kind of special interests. Sue. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to do it and think, think through a lot of the issues, which has been enjoyable to do. Thank you. No, thank you. And I will just share before we end this evening, uh, for those of you who don't know about the Stained Glass Museum, um, we have a fantastic collection of stained glass uh, from medieval to contemporary and everything in between. We are located in, inside Ely Cathedral in Cambridgeshire. Please do come and visit our wonderful collection and see our Boaty piece. And also consider supporting um, the museum by joining our friends organisation. Uh, we are an organisation that relies on paying visitors and events like this. So by buying a ticket to this lecture, you have supported the museum and thank you. Um, so thanks again okay. to Dr. C. Tate. Thank and you. all of you for joining us this evening and we wish you good night. Good night. <laughs>